welcome. Welcome from Edinburgh. I'm David Codling, uh, Program Director of the Cultural Protection Fund of the British Council, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of this series of discussions in collaboration with our partners, Shubak Festival Against Disappearance. This collaboration is between Shubak and the British Council, which is the Cultural Protection Fund's concept the, devised by the British Council, supported by the British government's Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. First of all, some technical information. There is British Sign Language interpretation, interpretation for those who need it, and you'll see on the chat line where you can, where you can find that. Um, and also I'd like to uh, remind people that the session is recorded um, and it will be available later, as was the first in the series uh, that, uh, that was done in December, available on the Shubak website. If you're sharing on Instagram or Twitter, um, please use the following hash tags, hash cultural heritage, hash contemporary culture, hash cultural protection fund. Now, the topic of these against disappearance sessions is the relationship between culture, cultural protection, and contemporary cultural practice. And uh, this is brought to you, as I said, by the Cultural Protection Fund or the British Council devised by the British Council with support from the British government's DCMS, Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, in collaboration with Shubak Festival. Now, the topic uh, today, um, we're, we're going to Sudan and to the Indian Ocean coast of East Africa. Several cultural protection fund projects there address the legacy of a region of shared trade and cultural exchange, as well as different imperial enterprises. It's a heritage which is now facing risk, not least from the impact of climate change. To evoke this shared cultural space, we present, first of all, two films, which you'll see back to back, and they involve guests from whom we'll be hearing shortly. First, uh, Abu Amira, our guest in Mombasa, Kenya, who is discussing the Hakaya Swahili Literature and Story Storytelling Festival, just concluded, in fact. Uh, the, its latest edition, and then we'll have Sudanese novelist Hamur Ziada, who will be reading an extract from his novel, Shoka Darwish, The Longing of the Dervish. Thank you, and once again, welcome. Hello, my name is Abdurrahman Abu Amir Andegwa. I'm the managing editor at Akaya Arts Initiative and uh, the convener of the annual uh, Swahili Literary Festival, which is entering its third uh, that edition this year. I will be celebrating the festival, or rather holding the festival um, in this venue, right here. Um, and the reason why I've chosen this venue for shooting this video is because I feel it represents exactly what uh, the festival and what Akaya represents, where we are trying to use contemporary and new methods to represent, to celebrate, and to preserve uh, the tradition. Um, right here, other than uh, those reasons, uh, this was the settlement place for the Waswahili, uh, specifically the Wakilindini. Uh, the Wakilindini are one of the three major tribes of the Swahili, and uh, these was the settlement. Uh, and we've had um, excavations that showed uh, the presence of cities, the presence of a mosque. And uh, right about a kilometer from here, we have a mosque that was demolished. Now it's all modern, that represented, that had three different places, representative of the three Swahili tribes. So this town is, has seen a lot of changes uh, over the centuries. Uh, we've seen changes in religion because Islam came in, a, in around uh, the 8th century and it found the Waswahili who were worshipping traditional gods because the Swahili uh, primarily are Bantu uh, and Islam is the predominant religion in the coast. 
Uh, we've seen changes in our culture through uh, interactions with different nations, different cultures, and different people. Because this being a strategic place uh, with the weather and uh, the trade routes from the sea, uh, brought, uh, brought in traders from, uh, from the Indian subcontinent and from Arabia. And it also gave the Swahili at that point uh, the chance to also further trade routes, you know, like further into the hinterland. We have stories of Waswahili who traded as far as um, uh, the border of, between Kenya and southern Sudan. And back then, there were no boundaries. So how we know this was the border between Kenya and, uh, and southern Sudan was the oral history that has been carried along uh, and of people who are tall and very dark-skinned that represent uh, the Nubian people of southern Sudan. And these people were brought in, uh, the women were given as gifts to the, uh, to the, to the businessmen and the traders. Uh, and they came in as house helps and ended up marrying, uh, get, getting married by the Swahilis and the kids uh, became uh, Waswahili. And um, there's evidence that also shows that the trade rules used by the Waswahili to trade all the way uh, almost similar to what uh, the, the Kenya-Uganda railway uh, took because the Indians who were used to erect uh, or construct uh, the railway were very vast in, uh, in engineering and they used to establish whether a particular place uh, had that strength to actually carry a railway and they used to put their ears on the ground and listen whether wild animals uh, you know, were coming or were in the vicinity. So other than those kind of changes, um, I think the biggest asset that we've had uh, in Mombasa and the coast in general is that interaction, uh, that linguistic interaction. You know, there's been a lot of uh, cultural and linguistic borrowing between, uh, between different, different, different spaces. Uh, we've borrowed a lot from uh, the Arabs and the Indians. And I'm sure if we delve into history further, uh, there is a lot we've also borrowed from the Portuguese. Uh, in as much as when you mention uh, the Portuguese, we only think of the looting and the plunder and the massacre uh, that uh, they did in the coast. Uh, because uh, history says, part of history says the reason why the Portuguese came was to establish uh, the trade routes, you know, for the gold trading between Kilwa uh, and other city states to Arabia and, uh, and India, but what we know for certain is they came through uh, a purple decree that, that sought to clear the world of Muslim and paganism. So this might explain the animosity and the, and the barbarism that they treated the Swahilis and the, the people along the coast uh, with. But um, as far as uh, linguistics go, uh, one of the greatest things that the Swahili or Kiswahili took into its own uh, fabric was the writing of Swahili poetry and everything about Swahili uh, written in Arabic text. So uh, people used to write in, uh, or should we, call it, should we call it Arabized Kiswahili for a very long time until the coming of the missionaries who felt maybe uh, Romanizing the Kiswahili would make it easier for them, one, to spread the gospel, two, it would remove uh, a little bit, you know, the elements of, of Islam, because Arabic and Islam are uh, one and the same thing. So, Romanizing Kiswahili meant at least there would be a little bit, uh, a little less um, influence from Islam. And uh, I feel this change also meant there's a lot of manuscripts history that we've lost because uh, we haven't seen any uh, manuscripts that probably were preserved during those days when you know our people just write in Arabic, uh, Arabized uh, Kiswahili and this is a loss on our side because we feel there's a huge chunk of history that went with those manuscripts and I mean uh, with the raising of Mombasa close to 10 times by the Portuguese that means we've also lost a whole lot of uh, manuscript history as well. So in my opinion, as a contemporary cultural producer, uh, I feel if we did or we took an approach to try and rejuvenate or try and investigate 
uh, and bring back uh, that wonderful uh, artistry where poets and writers and used the Arabized Swahili because this also brought uh, brought about the creation of new letters because there are some letters that we don't find in the Arabic text, you know, but they are found in Arabized Swahili. So this is an interesting interplay of language and I feel if we did or rather preserved and tried to find um, people who are still doing it, uh, I know of a few people, uh, probably just two people who are still doing that Arabized um, Kiswahili and up to date they still use that. He do the Arabized Kiswahili, uh, I know of a poet, Ustad Mao, who still does that and then he does it in Swahili and right now I think there's a group that is trying to, uh, to translate his works from his poetry from Swahili to, to English. Um, perhaps if we were to delve further into, into to the islands, Lamu, Pate, and, uh, and, and those areas, I feel, uh, because Mombasa has become more of this bustling cosmopolis with diverse cultures, but Lamu and the islands uh, have really managed to maintain the cultural practices, the traditional uh, cultural practices. And I'm certain if we do our investigation right, we would find maybe two, three, or even five more people who are still uh, writing their poetry in Arabic with Turkish Swahili. And if what we already have of people who are using that uh, script, if we can have an institution that can promote this, teach it to the young so that we can preserve it, this would be uh, a massive approach at uh, ensuring that, uh, that we are going back to what uh, uh, classical poets and classical writers used to express themselves. Um, hello, uh, uh, my name is uh, Hamur Ziada. Uh, I am uh, reading uh, some uh, pages uh, today from uh, my novel, The Longing of the Dervish. Uh, I'm reading it in Arabic and um, as I understand, there will be an uh, English uh, uh, subtitles so you can understand what I am saying in Arabic. Uh, okay. نزلوا بميناء سواك في يومهم الرابع أعظم مدن الساحل الغربي للبحر وأقدمها تمشي ثيودورا وسط رفاقها وهي دهشة مدينة عربية عتيقة مبانيها أشبه بخيالاتها عن الليالي العربية ألف ليلة وليلة بيوت من طابقين أو ثلاثة من حجر مرجاني كلاسي مستخرج من قعر البحر وعلى الشوارع الضيقة تطل الشرفات الخشبية ربما خلفها تنام شهرزاد تحلم يمشون في الشوارع الضيقة بين أخلاط من البشر فيهم أتراك مصريون كسر وأوروبيون يبدون كأفاقين أما الأهالي فسود جلودهم غليظة الهواء رطب مشبع بالملح ينضح ببرودة خفيفة والسماء متقلة بالسحب توشك أن تسقط على البيوت استضافهم حاكم المدينة وأكرمهم أنزلهم باستراحة الضيوف قرب الديوان واحتفى بهم علية القوم في المدينة من الأتراك والأوروبيين اعتبروهم إضافة إلى رسالة الحضارة التي تنحت في صم بربرية البلاد ثيودورا أحبت الوقوف في الطابق الثاني خلف النوافذ الخشبية المنحوتة تراقب المارة السود كخنافس نشطة يجوبون الشوارع تدون شقة من الدمور بلا سراويل يسيرون حفاة تفوح من شعورهم الخشنة الثائرة رائحة زيت الخروع أما النساء فرأتهم في مطبخ الاستراحة بشعور مجدولة متحليات بالأساور والحجول والخلاخل والعقود الشمس ساطعة في المدينة الأفقورية رغم السحب الثقيلة لكن ثيودورا تحس الظلام يشع من سواد البشر صلت للرب ألا يمتحن قلبها بالكبر مؤمنة أنهم خراف الرب السوداء الضالة لكن الراعي عليه أن يتواضع فشغلت نفسها 
بمغالبة الوحشة التي أحستها وأعجبها أن النسوة السود تحلقن حولها ودروتا ومن معهن من الأخوات يختبرن شعورهن الصهباء وثيابهن السابغة النظيفة في إعجاب تفكر ثيودورا أن رائحتهن ليست سيئة لكنها غريبة قبل الدعوة النساء إلى المطبخ فرأتهن يسكبن على الأرض سلت ما يطبخن وجلات سألت عن ذلك فأخبرنها أنهن يقدمن الطعام للجن قربانا لا يفسده على الآكلين قال لها الأب بولس سواكن بناها نبي الله سليمان حسب ما يدعي أهلها أرهق عصاة الجن سليمان بن داود فأرسلهم مكبلين إلى ذلك المكان وأمر جنده من الجن المطيع فشادوا مدينة حصينة أسوارها مرصودة حبس النبي العصاة في المدينة وأسماها سواجن يقول الأب بولس حين غلب البشر الجان على سكناها غيروا اسمها إلى سواجن يحكي لها أن سليمان بن داود ولد من بلقيس ابنا خاف عليه الأعداء اسمه سبا كملك أمه بعثه إلى بلاد السودان فبنى بها مدينة باسمه ثم جعل الناس اسمها سوبا يرهب أهالي سواكن القطط فهي جن عندهم لا يريقون الماء المغلي خوفا أن يصيب المخلوقات التي لا يرونها وعند المغرب يرفضون التحرك حتى يستقر الظلام في كل ركن من الدنيا كي لا يزاحم الجن في خروجه تحفظ سيودورا كل ذلك وتكتبه في خطابها الأول لأمها تسألها عن حالها بعيدة عنها في الأيام الفائتة ترسل سلامها لأخويها وقبل التوقير بيد والدها الغليظة الممتلئة تبسها الشوق والفرح أنها اقتربت من الوصول للخرطوم حيث ستخدم الرب Thank you. That was Hamur Ziada, preceded by Abu Amira, and we'll be hearing from them now uh, in conversation with Marina Warner. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Marina. It's also quite daunting, um, the, the range, depth, and variety of, of Marina's work um, is difficult to sum up in the very brief time available. Um, writer, novelist, critic, cultural historian, activist, professor of English and creative writing at Birkbeck College. Uh, Marina was uh, born in Britain, spent uh, much of her childhood and education uh, in Egypt, in Cairo, as well as in Belgium and in Britain. We'll return to Cairo in a, in a second. Um, and um, her work, vast range of, of work, reflects on in, in fiction and in studies of different uh, essays, re reflects on mythology, folklore, fairy tale, archetypes surrounding the feminine uh, throughout history as expressed in art, in texts, in fables, um, addressing colonial themes. Uh, Marina's work has also included work for um, children in, and includes libretti for operas. Um, she has academic and state honours from Britain, from France, from various countries, and has also, and here I mentioned Cairo again, because it features in her latest book, which has uh, just been published, in fact, uh, what she describes in the subtitle as an unreliable memoir, very tantalizingly, um, an inventory, inventory of a life mislaid, uh, which has just been published by HarperCollins. Now, a great honour and a warm welcome, Marina. Thank you so much, David, and for those very generous words. And it's a tremendous pleasure to be taking part in this panel with these wonderful writers and this very important theme. One of the most haunting and beautiful tales of the Thousand and One Nights, The City of Brass, tells the story of an explorer who sets out to find one of the lost cities of the desert. After many strange encounters, he and his fellow travelers come upon the ruins of the city of Brass, buried under the sands and haunted by jinn. It has been suspended in time, everyone inside it dead and mummified, like an enchanted castle in a fairy tale. But the undercurrent is that this city was once a real historical place, a rich bustling metropolis, a market and a trading post, 
until lack of water brought it to its end. We remember its glory now through narrative memory, exchanged from generation to generation across boundaries of languages and geography. Some traces exist in the written record, setting down the stories that had been told and passed on in performances spoken aloud. The theme of civilization's decline and fall is familiar. But in these days, when drought and famine caused by policies of endless economic growth, extraction and damage threaten many peoples so gravely, when wars are laying waste to towns and countryside, when some regimes imprison and torture their inhabitants, the word disappearance has unfortunately gained a new urgency. Alongside the disappeared people, culture is also suffering. Tangible goods are under stress, not only homes and fields, art and libraries, but also the intangible creations that have been transmitted through memory and on the voices and tongues of writers, poets, storytellers, and the movements and rituals of groups. Around 20 years ago, UNESCO recognized intangible cultural heritage was as vital to the survival of society as the great monuments like the pyramids. And it includes traditions or living expressions inherited from our ancestors and passed on to our descendants. This extends to works of poetic and narrative imagination in any medium. And the internet has increased the portability, the reach of such literatures. But apart from the destruction wrought by ecological blindness and conflict, local cultures have long been undermined by global pressures, imperial and colonial. And now even languages spoken by millions of people such as Arabic are under stress because of the increasing supremacy of English and the vastly powerful machines of US entertainment, which operate worldwide on the imagination of children. Yet strong resistance is building to this state of affairs in the Arab world and in Africa. And it is possible that the internet can be harnessed to support reinvigoration of literature in Arabic and Swahili, for example, and prevent them disappearing. We are very fortunate in having these two most eloquent writers and activists here to discuss many questions arising from this situation and many possible responses to illuminate what is disappearing and what can reappear out of this nexus of dangerous forces. How to resist cultural loss of diversity in the process of becoming contemporary. You have already heard from Abu Amira um, in the film. His short stories combine open-eyed observation of contemporary social mores with shivery traces of hauntings and mystery. He is the founder director of Ikaya, we heard about, an arts organization in Mombasa on that east coast. And Hakaya means short story in Kiswahili. And Hakaya is acting as the inspiration and catalyst of literature in this coastal region with this long history of trading, as you heard, across the Indian Ocean, subcontinent. Oh, there you are. And farther afield. Besides Hakaya, with many ideas and activities, include the Swahili Literary Festival he founded three years ago. And you heard its third edition has just taken place. The theme then was women, since women are conduits of so much intangible culture, as well as originators in their own right. We will talk about this with Abu Amira and other, pl other plans of his later. Hamur Ziada is from Omdurman in the Sudan, and now lives and works in Cairo, where he writes for many Sudanese newspapers. He's published novels and short stories in Arabic, including a life story from Omdurman in 2010 and sleeping at the foot of the mountain in 2014. You have heard that poetic passage from the beginning of his book, Longing for the Dervish. And the novel explores the complex tapestries of faiths in his country in the 19th century through a passionate story of love and revenge unfolding during the bloody violence of, 1880, of the 1880s at the beginning of the Anglo-Sudan Wars, which lasted until the turn of the century, after the charismatic leader, the Mahdi, led an uprising of Sufi believers and the British and Egyptians made common cause to suppress this dervish army. General Gordon was killed and there were terrible, unforgotten reprisals. The novel enters the history from varying points of view with unflinching gra graphic intensity. 
It won the Najib Mahfouz Prize in 2014 and has been translated into English by Jonathan Wright and reads very powerfully. Hamoud has recently also had a short story published in translation in a fine collection called The Book of Khartoum. This one is called The Void. And the title, as well as evoking the losses suffered in war, also hints at the breaches in the historical record which writers can fill through imagination. Hamoud, can you tell us a little bit about your, your approach to history through your fiction? Because you seem to me to draw on a great number of traditions as well as the historical record. There's a combination of archival material, letters, and also many beliefs, folk, folk material. I, for instance, I thought I caught a trace of Majun and Leila, the great love story, in your central love story. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> uh, I look to history as um, it's part of uh, um, part of art, a piece of art. Uh, it's waiting to be written. Um, it's to, told us uh, a lot uh, about uh, people, about their beliefs, about what they are doing. It's a very lovely stories for me. Uh, and for our traditions, um, history in Sudan, um, we can say we are still living this history. Uh, people in Sudan still believe in things that they believe in it in the 19th century. Uh, still the enemies of the 19th century, they think they are their enemies now till, till these days. Um, you, for me, I looked to my country or my people and culture uh, like um, time just uh, has just uh, been frozen for uh, a long time. Uh, we are still prisoner, prisoners uh, in the 19th century or the 18th century else. Um, so when, um, when I, I start writing about uh, anything, uh, I can't just forget about history. Even my, my, my other stories, which about recent time, I found myself going back to history to find uh, why we are here now. What's the point we started uh, from it? Um, last year, I was lucky to visit uh, Britain with invitation from Durham University, St. Edwin College, and uh, uh, Panibal uh, uh, Magazine uh, has a fellowship uh, in Durham University uh, to visit the uh, archive. They have a great archive about Sudan there. Uh, the plan was to work uh, for two months in the archive uh, to look in it to write my new novel, uh, but unfortunately came the pandemic and the um, town and the whole country was closed. Uh, I uh, get blocked there for four months, unfortunately. Uh, but I found a, a, a very interesting and uh, very lovely pieces of history that I'm using in my next uh, novel. Are the letters from Theodora, are they actual real letters or did you invent them? No, I invent them, uh, but uh, some of them were built on um, some visitors, European visitors who wrote about Sudan in that time. I used that information and I wrote it in Theodora's tongue or words to put it in the novel. And in this way, you managed to get many voices into the, even though the book is mainly through the eyes of the hero, you get a lot of voices into the book, different points. Yeah, I, 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 tried, I tried to introduce the uh, European voice in that time. Theodora was uh, racist, uh, looking to our people as a barbarian and black poor people. We are black and we were poor and still poor, but uh, you know, she was looking uh, um, to us with this wide view, point of view. Um, as a Christian and coming to, to, to lead us to, to God and to the civilization. And I tried also to write about uh, the Sudanese people in that time, how they were looking to the British and the Turkish. Um, yeah, I tried to write with many voices. I, I love to do this trick. I did the first time in my first novel, it's called Conj. Uh, I wrote about um, Sudanese people in a village with uh, several uh, points and several points of uh, voices and points of view. And I tried to do it again in the longing of the dervish. Uh, I think this dialogue between these voices which make people reading the novel can understand um, uh, separate point, uh, points of view. Very good. 
Um, Abu Amira, you are also cre cre creating a forum for many voices to emerge. Can you tell us a little bit more about Hekayo and your various activities? Um, uh, thank you for, for having us. Um, it was a pleasure listening to Hamur uh, doing his reading. There's so much similarity between his stories and what we experience every day in Mombasa as part of culture. Um, Hekaya, one of the major reasons why we started Hekaya was um, because of history that we felt had not been documented, history that we felt we had not been part of. I remember reading uh, Kekresh's book, uh, Philosophizing in Mombasa, and I read about uh, the famous uh, his poet, uh, Sheikh Nabahan, and it saddened me that I was in Mombasa and I never got to meet his, uh, this poet. And, uh, and his works are amazing and they tell so much about the Swahili and, and, and Kiswahili as a language. And uh, that was one of uh, the things that made us start uh, Hekaya Arts Initiative. And uh, in as much as we wanted to get into the scene and try and publish more stories, because by the time we were starting in 2017, Hekaya, uh, there were very few published uh, writers from the coast. I remember when we went for writing visit in 2016, I was alone, and uh, I only got to meet one more writer from the coast, I think the same year, and uh, it felt somehow lonely, you know, being alone, and yet uh, I feel there's so much talent in Mombasa. Uh, we are the products of the only uh, creative writing workshop that was held in Mombasa in 2015. And I've seen uh, writers bad from that, uh, become better writers. And uh, we've been trying to do various workshops and, um, and conversations with writers, trying to get more writers um, published. And uh, I'm glad to see uh, other people joining in the effort. Uh, we have a group called the Creative Writers League that uh, we normally back now in, in different events. And um, some of the best or some of the most promising writers of Kiswahili in the course coming from this forum is Creative Writers League. And uh, we're getting more women, especially, who are getting published, especially in, in Swahili. Uh, so apart from the fact that we wanted to, uh, to build a platform where coastal stories can be told, uh, we also wanted to archive history. Um, I mean, uh, the Swahili Coast has a long uh, manuscript history, and we wanted to document this in as much as uh, we may not go back and try and um, uh, find out where all these manuscripts were. Uh, we can do what we can uh, right now because we have a digital platform um, where we can uh, do digital representations and digital archival spaces for this. Uh, but most importantly, in these uh, is one of the things that uh, at Hekaya we are trying to do and leave it as a legacy is to build a physical archival space, mm -hmm. you know, where the, this can be used as a point of cultural tourism and cultural education. Because we feel the history that our children are learning in school is not, it is history, yes, but there's so much that has been left out, especially about the cost. And building this archival space where these children can access our history, our literature, um, an authentic part of it. I think this would, uh, in a huge way, um, lead to more understanding uh, on, on, on uh, what should I call this, and on what really led us to this point, you know, in the Swahili coast. And uh, I'm glad that, uh, as we say, that other people are coming on board uh, and other people are embracing these idea of the fact that we need to have uh, an archival space because uh, a lot of our history has been lost because our forefathers, our grandfathers never had that archival fever, that archival spirit, you know? And the little history that we have has been carried on orally. Mm -hmm. And uh, the challenges with uh, oral transmission is that uh, there's a lot of changes that uh, can, alter, can alter history. And um, uh, somebody can tell a story uh, subjectively rather than objectively and that way we'll also lose a part of, of that history. But you've also started this project which is very fascinating called a traveling story which is a story written by many hands and I wonder if you could it's called Kazkazi 
Could you tell us a bit more about that, but also uh, perhaps put it in the context of how the internet is paradoxically, while, while global, is also a way of being local. The internet is actually helpful in creating connections between people. But tell us about Kaskazi first. Um, Kaskazi um, is a project that we, we brought in different writers. Uh, initially, we had 25 writers for the project. But ultimately, I think we, we ended up with uh, 16 writers. Um, the idea to have Kaskazi was because we wanted this collective approach to storytelling in the course. And uh, personally, I felt myself doing the story may not have the same impact as different people doing the story. Um, I mean, uh, it just came up as an idea how we can reach out to writers in Tanzania and Zanzibar and other places in the course and, um, and participate in something. And uh, we thought, why not try a story? Because, I mean, the essence of stories is to connect people, to connect spaces. And there's so much similarity in different, uh, you know, different cities along the coast. Um, I've never been to Kilwa. I've never been to Bagamoyo or Zanzibar. I've been to Lamu. And uh, I see a lot of similarities between Lamu and Old Town Mombasa, which is just uh, not far from, from where, I, uh, where I stay, where I live. Uh, so much as we had not traveled physically from Kilwa all the way back to Mombasa, uh, we felt we can take a fictional journey and we can take writers along with us. Um, so basically, Kaskazi, um, we call it the traveling fiction because one, it traveled between spaces, between, you know, from Kilwa, uh, I think to Dodoma, Moshi, to Mombasa, all the way up to Kyunga, and then down to Mombasa and, and finished, uh, and then ended in Kilwa. Uh, that was one part of the traveling. Uh, the second part of traveling was because it felt uh, this story uh, coming from one person, going to another person who enriches it, adds uh, a couple of words to it and sends it to another person is another aspect of travel as well. You know, the traveling, uh, can call it, I don't know, uh, traveling like, you know, from one mind to another. And uh, to be honest, it was one of the most uh, difficult projects we ever engaged in because these were writers we've never worked with before. And um, we had a story, a storyline. Um, and a character, character board. And what we did, we started the first uh, 2,000 words and sent it to the first writer. We added the 2,000 words and sent it back to us for editing. And we sent the 4,000 words to the second writer. So that was the process. You know, like you get uh, a story, maybe written by five people, it's 10,000 words. So one, you have to read 10,000 words yes. for you to add your 2,000 words. So in a way, we also trying to push for a reading initiative in the course. And I mean, the internet came in handy because I've never, we've never met these writers physically. We just communicated through emails and messages and, and, and all that. And up to now, we haven't met all of us as a group. So I feel um, it also really helped uh, to push the story. And much as we never got to travel physically, we also felt that like, yes, somehow we've traveled along the coast. I would like Amur to, Amur, can you compare again, please? Because I want to ask both of you to think, to talk, hello, to talk a little bit about the question of what to retain, what to revive. Because it's quite striking in the Zadzaki story, and actually in your own short stories too, that modernity, contemporary life, has many costs, and so did the past. So in Hamur's uh, novel and your vision, there is quite quite harsh um, imagery and scenes of slavery, of the actual practice of slavery, also of rituals that are you know, very uh, harsh on women. And so there are elements of the past, and similarly in the Zadzaki story, I, I felt that, Kazakazi, sorry, that um, I felt that, you know, you were grappling with the difficulties of what memory brings or what modernity brings, this tension between them. It could perhaps some would you recommend? It's not just about the memory and the history. Um, you see in the other world, in, in Britain or in uh, America, um, slavery is uh, forbidden for uh, uh, many years now. But in Sudan, uh, there was slavery, legal slavery 
till 1920 or something like this. Uh, but after that, there is no legal slavery, but still this um, a relationship, power relationship between the, 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 the past owners and the slaves and uh, their sons and grandsons. Uh, still till now, my family in my village, we have slaves, not the legal slaves. We don't own them. But our relationship, it is still built on what my grandfather did to their grandfather. They still uh, look up to me as an owner, as a, a great cousin, uh, that the man who went for, for their weddings or um, the, the, to pay them uh, in, 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 uh, in um, holidays or something like this. And they're willing to serve me in anything without, without paying. They feel loyal to, to, to me to, and to my family. And it's very sad to, 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 to see this. Uh, when I was in uh, college, there was um, this uh, guy who's in, in, in another college. Uh, uh, he, in, his mother was a slave in my uh, village, not for my family, for another family. But we are not colleagues. We are both uh, students in the college. But he looks up to me like uh, a master, and he is a slave. Uh, and it's not, it's not just about history. It's, just, it's about this moment. This is what brings us to war in Sudan, because um, the, 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 the African um, uh, people uh, with the Arabian have a lot of issues uh, coming from that uh, ancient history, which we're still living till now. Um, this also happening to, 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 to women. Uh, we have a lot of uh, for issues uh, leg uh, legally by law. Um, um, women in Sudan have many rights, like um, many countries. But what the 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 the, the culture uh, does is more powerful than law. Mm -hmm. uh, people uh, are looking to women as their grandfathers were looking to their grandmothers, still uh, training them the uh, the same way. Uh, the, 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 the religion, haram, and fatwa, fatwa uh, uh, is governing the, the, the society more than the law and the women's rights. Mm. Abu, what do you, Abu Amira, sorry, come, what? Yes, um, yes it's interesting that uh, Hamur mentions the um, uh, aspect of uh, haram and halal and, and fatwas because um, I think we also uh, grapple with some of um, uh, the same challenges, especially when it comes to um, thinking about cultural practices that, um, that are at risk, uh, either through religion or through modernity. Um, I, had, I had the opportunity of speaking to a, an elderly gentleman. Uh, he's a reservoir of history. And uh, he was telling me how years ago uh, in Mombasa, uh, uh, I mean, Mombasa is an island, so we have like three gateways in the sea, and uh, in each of these gateways we had shrines back then. Uh, even when the Portuguese came, we still had uh, these shrines. Uh, so what used to happen, uh, people used to give uh, sacrifices in every one of these shrines, and how they used to do it was maybe they could have a feast, and then the bones are now thrown away. Uh, so instead of just collected in sacks and thrown or rather deposited uh, at the shrine that is at the sea. So this was a way of appeasing uh, the spirits of the sea. And according to them, this is what used to protect the city until uh, maybe around the 1960s when Islamic scholarship changed and people understood different aspects of religion. And this was casted aside as, as um, shirk, shirk, um, hamur. Uh, Tell me, sure, in English, uh, how? how? Um, to follow many gods, not only Allah. Yes, uh, precisely. So this, I mean, when Islam scholarship uh, was at its peak in the 1960s, these things were considered as updated, as haram, as everything. But some of the people felt uh, that getting rid of these shrines was what really introduced wars and conflict in Mombasa, after that, you know, like political conflict and um, uh, uh, the city doesn't seem to, uh, to grow as fast as its counterpart Nairobi. So some people say that if they attribute uh, these uh, changes to the fact that we no longer hold uh, 
true to our cultural practices. So yeah, I mean, uh, it's an interesting uh, side of the story. What, what happened in your women's edition of the festival? Uh, did the women talk about rituals that they felt they'd lost or that they could regain or was there an, that aspect? Because that's been quite a significant aspect of some European and American women's writing. Mm -hmm. The idea that yes. we need more ceremonies for our, or a sense, a sense of the feasts of our lives. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, um, we had two interesting conversations at the festival regarding women. One was um, an activity or an event that, that is called Vugo, that is V-U-G-O, and Vugo is a primarily uh, literary space for women where they can express themselves uh, without men being, uh, you know, in the presence. Uh, and this was interesting because it was one of those things that um, uh, people in Mombasa have really forgotten and rarely do. And most of the people who were doing the Fugo and talking about the Fugo and interviewing a lady who's really carried on this tradition, uh, largely from Lamu, because as I, I may have mentioned in the video, uh, Mombasa has really changed, you know, that movement of people has influenced Aswahili culture in a way, but the islands of Lamu have remained uh, quite true to their traditions, to their cultural practices, and some of these things still happen in Lamu, as opposed to other uh, states within, I mean, other cities in, in the coast. And um, the second conversation was about women, not only in literary spaces, but in activism. And uh, uh, the presenter, uh, a good friend, Samia, uh, she talked about how women, uh, and she was focusing on one woman in the 1800s, she's called uh, Mwana Kukona. Uh, she wrote a very lovely poem to her daughter. Um, they talked about how she, as a woman, in a very conservative space, um, performed her poetry outside the king's palace, which was considered, you know, it was forbidden that a woman cannot perform uh, poetry or anything outside the king's palace and she went there and performed a poetry as an act of I mean that was one of the most significant act, uh, act of uh, women in activism way back then and also about inserting the role of women in Swahili culture which, which is I think uh, mostly conceived as male dominated so I mean women played their part and they played their part as well in, in activism so these Conversations also remind people, uh, or, or rather women in the course, uh, of their role in cultural and literary production and propagation. The, um, this cultural program against disappearance is very often concerned with, the, with places, with actual physical places. And you mentioned you, that you wanted your, your art center in Mombasa to be a center and that w we could come there and take part and listen and so forth, perhaps online, but um, and that it would be an active hub. But I wondered if you also mentioned, I think in one of your stories, about naming streets for the past, reviving the history through the naming streets. And I'd like Hamoud to comment on that too, because I know that in Cairo, and perhaps in the Sudan, but also in Cairo, there's a lot of rebuilding. And what you both think about that, about the changing fabric of the built environment. Not, not the intangible environment, they're connected because the name of the streets is to do with narrative. Uh, I'm well, I mean, it's an interesting... Abu Amira. Okay, Amira. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Amira, go ahead. Uh, all right, uh, I'm sorry. Um, it's interesting how you brought out the issue of naming streets because uh, as you mentioned, how Mombasa has become, how the culture has become so diverse with so many other people coming in. Uh, there's a street that was named after the late Professor Ali Mazrui. But it's funny that on one side, it's named Professor Ali Mazrui. And on the end of the other of the street, it still retained its original name. So I found this as a very half-hearted way of, of commemorating him and you know celebrating him. I mean, he did his part in Swahili and scholarship and all that. And um, there's a role that was changed recently, I think in the last three years. Uh, that was named after a very young man, a son of a politician from Nairobi. Uh, he passed away tragically, 
Uh, so somebody took the liberty of naming one of our streets after him, which was quite unusual and I think it's an insult of sorts because we have so many people who are being forgotten. We have Chef and Vita and we have been had one of the greatest poets. We have Mona Kukona. We have, I mean, countless people who have been forgotten because there's no way they've been commemorated, especially in our roads. Most of our roads uh, have names from our country. Hamor. Uh, uh, for for us, it is different. Um, you know, Khartoum was built like uh, 1830 by the Turkish. Uh, we still have uh, Turkish buildings like uh, the main palace of the government and the Ministry of uh, Foreign uh, uh, Affairs and, and, another, and other buildings. But about the streets, um, uh, you know, in Sudan, we have this uh, evil circle. Uh, um, uh, uh, regime, uh, military regime, and then a, a revolution, democracy for two or three years, and then a military regime. So we are rewriting our history and uh, naming uh, uh, the streets over and over every time, every 10 or 15 years, they change it. Uh, for the past 30 years, uh, most of the town of uh, Khartoum was named about the Islamic leaders of the regime. Uh, there is not a lot uh, about history there in uh, left. Uh, unfortunately, even the museums and the old buildings which uh, open to visit for the people to see the history was uh, locked down and closed for more than five or some buildings for 10 years. Nobody go there. Um, uh, the, the, the past regime, uh, the Islamic regime in Sudan, it, 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 it uh, declared war against the culture and again, it's history. They think anything is not Islamic or Arabic uh, must be pushed away. Uh, so now after revolution, uh, we are trying to rebuild this again and uh, to get involved with, uh, with uh, our African culture uh, and our history and make peace with, with it. Uh, I don't know how we are going to succeed or not, uh, but uh, we are hoping uh, the, uh, good. Uh, we have another city, an old city, Sawakin, which I, I wrote about in uh, Lo uh, Longing of the Dervish, and the video was about it. Um, Sawakin was a great city, the Turkish city, and a great port. Uh, it's totally destroyed now. There's uh, actually no one rock uh, over the other. It's totally destroyed. Uh, six years ago, uh, the Turkish government came and uh, signed an agreement with the Sudanese government to rebuild Sawakin again, uh, but uh, it's not going to anywhere till now. But um, I wish uh, two or three years later, uh, it will become not great again, but uh, only as a, a city. And I am going to, going to tell you a lovely story about women in Sawakin. Uh, I visited Sawakin um, four months or three months ago. There was a museum there with the pictures about people in Sawakin in the last century. Uh, I was, there was a friend with me, she's, a, she's an activist, and she uh, noticed that there's no women in the, in the photographs. And she asked our guide, uh, where there's no women here in the photograph? And he just answered her with an honest voice and with any doubt, there were no women in that time. He just said it. There was no women there in that time, as they just became women in the 19th, 20th century out of nowhere. Uh, that's gin. the culture and they what. Were <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were gin. Uh, so if all those poor men were married to gin. Abu Amira writes about it's, it's, gin. It's, 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 <laughs> So I think we're coming rather near to the end now. So I would like you to perhaps tell, tell us what's the best way that we can, I don't know, be involved with Hakaya or with the, with the project of writing in the Sudan. Um, what's the best things that, what, what are your hope, best hopes? Uh, for me in Sudan, I think there's um, an opportunity now with this new government uh, a lot of them are, were activists and uh, they were working uh, in, in, in um, organization, uh, world organization in the WHO or the UN. 
Um, so they are very open now to make partnership with the world. Uh, and um, I think they may be festivals in Sudan or trying to, to uh, there's a, a British council in Sudan also. Uh, it's, um, it was working in a very hard uh, times during the last the past regime. But I think now they can uh, produce uh, another programs and uh, they were, will find uh, absolutely a, a lot of people interesting to get involved in this. Good, okay. Abu Amira. Um, right now I feel the festival uh, we just uh, completed yesterday has really opened uh, avenues where people are talking about cultural preservation and uh, having better ways and more proactive ways of telling our story. Um, one way I think we would assist in this is perhaps having, um, uh, not, not, not really conferences, uh, workshops where young writers can learn more about the craft because in as much as we might have talent, but this talent also needs to be channeled in the right way, yes. you know, so that they can properly tell the story. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've I've been an attendee of several workshops so far, and I would say like after every workshop, I feel I've grown as a writer. And I keep thinking of these young writers, these upcoming writers who are so passionate about telling the postal story properly because they, they, they come into terms with their identity as really, uh, their identities as, identity as writers living in the coast. Okay? And I feel if we give them this push to actually tell the story better, this would be uh, something amazing. Um, another thing, uh, as we are trying to build this physical and digital archival space, I think we need as much as you know collaboration and help from everyone because history is everywhere. And uh, the Swahili Coast has interacted with different spaces. We've interacted with the Portuguese as much as they burned our city down ten times. I think quite, quite a number of times. I think. Uh, we've interacted with the British, we've interacted with the Chinese, uh, with the Turkish, and uh, each of these spaces, uh, they have their own, um, they've active their own interaction with the Swahili Coast. So if there's a way we can build on these interactions, these collaborations, where we can get some of these and share it in our own spaces as well, I think this would really help in understanding and preserving our culture. I think it's a very inspiring thought. I'm. I'm hoping we can, I'm longing to elaborate um, if I'm involved in any workshops. Very exciting. Um, thank you both very, very much. Many applause, much applause from our silent, our ghosts out there. Um, that was a most stimulating exchange. Thank you so much. I think Eckhart now has some things to say. Yes, and thank you very much. I'm Eckhart Tima. <laughs> I'm the artistic director of the Shabak Festival, and I'm so pleased that we are collaborating with the British Council on this series against disappearance. This discussion has, of course, been recorded and will be available on our website and on the British Council's website very soon. The first event of the series, where we look particularly at the role of archives, of music and archaeology is already available. So uh, just go on the Shabak or the British Council website. As a festival of contemporary Arab culture, we invite artists to create and to share their imaginations, their ideas, their propositions about how we understand our world and its future. And the material they draw from, the kind of the fertile ground, is of course very often in the past. Uh, and in heritage and in histories, real or imagined. Uh, and that nourishes and inspires artistic creation. So this is again one of the reasons why we're so delighted about this series. And we were really, really pleased to arrange for a meeting between Hamur Ziada and Marina Warner, who have both appeared in previous Shabak editions, festival programs, joined by Abu Amira, with whom we collaborate for the very first time. Uh, thank you so much for your contribution. I think you've left us with a very rich, a very textured and nuanced discussion that will resonate with us for a long time. And what are for us the next steps? Uh, not soon, um, um, 
not, not, not far away, between the 29th and the 31st of March, Heritage of Future Past is a three-day online event curated by the British Council, which will highlight the value of cultural heritage and its contemporary relevance. So look out for that on the British Council's website. We will be publishing a text of an interview soon by Najwa bin Shatwan, the wonderful Libyan writer, who's picked up on some of the themes we've spoken today, particularly the experience of slavery from a Libyan perspective in her book, The Slave Pens. This will be available within the next couple of months. And of course, there should back 2021 to look forward, which takes place in London and beyond and of course in the digital realm now at the end of June and July. The program is not out yet, but sign up on our, on our website to receive the latest information. And of course, if you have some spare time while you wait, David already mentioned Marina's new book, um, Inventory of a Life Misled, it's available now. You can have some really good hours with that. And last but not least, now I just want to thank the wonderful behind the scenes colleagues at Shabak and the British Council who've made this event run so smoothly, especially John for his technical support and our BSL interpreters, Charlotte and Duncan. So for today, thank you very much for taking part and I hope to see you at the next event. Goodbye. <laughs>